Hi there. Thank you for listening to Hashtag NATO Jobs, the podcast. My name is Julie, and I'm your host for this first season of conversations with NATO staff about working for the Alliance. Each episode, I have a chat with one of the staff members to discuss their experience. They give you an insight into their personal NATO journey from A to Z. What made them decide to apply to NATO? How do they feel their current job allows them to make an impact? And what would they say to someone who's thinking of applying? During this episode, I'm talking to Yannick Petri. Welcome to the studio, Yannick. How are you today? Hi, Julie. Thanks for having me. Very welcome. How are you doing? Not too nervous? <laughs> no, it's, it's fine. It's an interesting experience for me. It's my very first podcast, so let's see how that's going. Yeah, interesting experience indeed. Um, well, thank you for taking the time to meet me. You already explained you have a pretty busy schedule. Um, so, um, yeah, just the fact that you take out the time in your day to, uh, to have this conversation with me, I really appreciate it. Um, but again, as you're pretty busy, I'd say let's jump right in. Um, and could you tell us a bit about your background, please, both on a personal and professional level? Yeah, would love to. So I'm from a small town in the south of Germany. So um, it's taken me quite a long road to, to end up in Brussels, um, ultimately. So yeah, I've, um, I've studied um, most of my time really in, in Germany. That's more the, I suppose, more on the professional level. So I spent really 18 or 19, almost 19 years of my, of my life um, in the same town. And then I moved to a different big city in Germany to do my bachelor's degree. And then afterwards, I moved to the Netherlands to study international relations and economics and governance. Okay. And that ultimately led me to, to work in this international environment in Brussels. Okay. So that's a short version, I suppose. <laughs> that's a very short version <laughs> indeed. We can elaborate a bit. Um, what bachelor's degree did you pursue? Yeah, so that's, that's quite interesting um, because I, I did something completely different from my bachelor's degrees. I studied business administration with a focus on, on, on finance and, and well, industry. So there was a completely different route that I took there. And it, it's mainly because back then, so I graduated about 10 years. Well, I'm old now. <laughs> I graduated around 10 years ago um, from high school in Germany. And back then, really, compared to the Anglo-Saxon um, education system, international relations as a program, did not really exist, or I think there were two or three universities that offered it, but it was really not on the radar. In Germany, similar to France, I think you have these very classical study programs like political science, law, but not these interdisciplinary programs. Um, so I didn't really know about these kind of programs. Um, I just knew that I was always interested in reading the newspaper, interested in what's happening in society. But then I took a more conventional career and studied business administration. Um, I was working at the same time at a large automotive company in Germany, um, which was nice in a, in a sense because it already allowed me to dive into the actual work environment. So it wasn't like a fully theoretical um, degree. Um, and they also allowed me to travel abroad a bit. But in the end, it was very... I hate to say it, but it was quite boring. But one time they actually sent me on a business trip to, to Vienna. And um, there I met a former friend from my, my uh, scholarship program. And she told me that she's organizing this Model United Nations conference in Bucharest. And I was like, hey, that sounds cool. And I've also never heard about that before because it's also not a big thing in Germany, or at least it wasn't back then. Um, and Bucharest wasn't too far away from Vienna, so I was like, okay, let's do this. I took a few days off, jumped on a plane to, to Bucharest and participated. And there I met a lot of people that were super interesting and, and also super interested in the world. Um, and they all studied international relations. So after I graduated my bachelor's, I basically dropped everything, even though I already had a job offer from, from my company, and said, okay, let's start over. And then I moved to the Netherlands and start, uh, studied international relations, okay. first in, in Groningen, then in, in the Hague at Leiden University. So you really took a chance there. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's that's what it really comes down to in life in general. Just be open to opportunities that arise left and right. And um, in the end, there's a lot of a lot of luck and, and opportunity involved always. Yeah, it always is this kind of mix of luck and opportunity. And then exactly. also recognizing opportunity based on previous experiences, which yeah. you maybe did not know that were that important at the time. Yeah, exactly. So, and yeah. I think that's 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 totally fine. And and. I think you also have to be honest at some point. Yes, of course, it's sort of an achievement. It's an achievement to to get to a certain degree, or it's it's an achievement to get a certain job. But you also have to be honest to yourself that there's also a lot of luck involved. And the I think the best thing you can do is, um, yeah, 
create the best basis for luck to strike yeah. and for opportunity to hit. Um, and then the rest is, yeah, just a... The rest is history or future, depends exactly. on how you look at it. Okay. And do you consider yourself lucky of uh, being able to work here at NATO? Most of the days, yes. <laughs> so, yesterday was a bit of a long, a long night. So um, sometimes you kind of reconsider your your life choices. But I think if if you don't do that, then you probably ended up in the wrong position, anyways. Yeah. Because um, every day is different, and there's always challenges. And without that, you don't. Have, with the, without the bad days, there are no good days. So. No, oh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You also you always need uh, some kind of frame of reference to be able to recognize what's good, what's bad, exactly. and to count your blessings. Yeah. yeah. And talking about those challenges and the. Uh, kind of rough day you had yesterday what is it that you do on a daily basis yeah that's where it's get where it's getting a bit more boring i suppose <laughs> <laughs> no I'm, i'm joking it's actually quite interesting so i work in the defense investment division which sounds mm -hmm. quite obscure at first but it's one of the many divisions that we have here at nato headquarters in brussels and um the defense investment division in in short um and i could talk about this for an hour but in short it's really about development of military capabilities by providing yeah, policy, technical or financial expertise, ultimately to generate the famous and um, very, very popular word in NATO to create interoperability among, among all the allies um, and to, to fulfill NATO's missions. As you know, NATO itself is, has almost no capabilities, like physical capabilities itself, but it's more bringing together allied capabilities. So it's really about bringing allies together, bringing nations together and and trying to, to make them work together in a, in a more efficient and effective and coordinated way. Okay. It's all about interoperability. I'm, I'm going to keep, keep uh, repeating that word a bit more often. <laughs> okay. But the way you explained it right now, I think it will make a perfect sense to our listeners. Yeah. Um, Could you uh, tell us a bit about a project that you've done in the past, or is that top secret information? So um, within the Defense Investment Division, obviously, there, there are a couple of different different sections or, or units that, 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 that focus on different areas, uh, more specifically. And I'm in the, and now we're starting with the acronyms. The Here we I go. <laughs> I'm working in the in the ILM team. So the I stands for ISR. So the I is basically an acronym itself. Um, um, and the ISR means... Um, Intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and okay. the L stands for land, and the M stands for maritime. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm specifically working in the ISR team, so I'm working in the intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance area, and this is really about providing situational awareness for all the decision makers in the alliance. It's about being able to see what's going on on the ground, whether that is um, through drones, planes, satellites, um, you name it. Um, I think it's, it's self-explanatory that if you want to take a decision for a NATO mission, you need to understand what's going on on the ground. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't know what's going on, you can't take any decisions. So that's kind of the, that's kind of the baseline. And um, one quite exciting project um, during my work in the ISR team was launching together with a, with a, with a colleague of mine, or being, being uh, one, of the, one of the people participating in the launch of, of this new project. Um, it's called the APSS, and there's the, the, the next acronym, but it's basically a space program. It um, doesn't mean that NATO is launching anything into space, but it is a very large space initiative at NATO, and it's about um, providing, again, situational awareness from space. So it's, it's, creating, it's about creating a, a virtual constellation of national satellites and commercial satellites and combining all of them to provide a better picture of what's happening on the ground. So really looking down from space on the ground. And it's the objective is to, to enable NATO to understand what is happening everywhere at any time. It doesn't mean that NATO is, or that the Alliance is surveying any, any area um, or every area all the time, but when they need to look somewhere, they're able to look at it. From what you're describing, it sounds, um, it sounds a bit like back to the future. <laughs> Absolutely, and uh, as, as you can as you can hear, I'm, I'm sometimes struggling to explain it in a bit more simple terms because even though we all, I think, no matter who you're talking to at NATO, they're all complaining about all the acronyms and, and technical terms that we're using, and I'm definitely one of them. But um, at the same time, I also constantly. Um, yeah, I think know, it, it happens before you know it because you're surrounded yes. by it on an everyday basis. Exactly. Um, there's no yeah. there's no escaping. That's definitely a warning to everyone who wants to join NATO. Yeah, you Your language is going to change. <laughs> 
Um, and so how did you find yourself at NATO, if you could bl briefly explain that? Um, did you come in straight after your studies in the Netherlands or did you take some pit stops in between? So there were some pit stops in between. And um, I think everyone who studies international relations, at least in, in, in Europe, um, that I talk to, they all want to work for similar organizations like the UN, the EU and, and NATO, uh, all these kind of organizations. So I was obviously uh, one of them. And I applied to two internships, uh, one at the European Commission and and one at NATO. And I was lucky enough to get both of them. So, But because of all the clearance process with NATO, <laughs> I had plenty of time to, to complete my, my Blue Book traineeship at the European Commission mm -hmm. before. Um, and um, yeah, there I was working on a completely different subject on serious organized crime and European drugs policy. So that was that was also quite a new territory. But that's also very much aligned with what I'm doing at NATO in the sense that I'm constantly working on topics that I've never heard about before. That sounds interesting and challenging because I know how I am. Um, and when I have to talk about topics I don't know anything about and before I feel really comfortable doing anything tangible, I really want to make sure I have full context. But if you're faced with that on a daily basis, it can get kind of difficult to to feel comfortable, I think. Absolutely. I think you really have to be, you have to be very resilient. I'm also talking about resilience. Um, mm -hmm. that's, that's also one of the main terms that we constantly use at NATO. But it's, it's, it's actually very true that you need resilience in, in working here in this very... Uh, challenging and dynamic environment um, and you really have to be optimistic about being able to deliver on your work and on your tasks and I'm not talking about blind blind positivity in the sense that you know it's all going to be fine and if there's a challenge arising yeah it's just going to be fine you still have to be realistic about some of the challenges and some of the obstacles that you're facing um, but be confident that you and the team will be able to to work it out somehow. Mm -hmm. You're talking about you and the team. How important is your team support to you? It's all about people, really. I mean, at the end, the entire organization only exists or consists of people. Um, so every day, uh, whether it's a good day or a bad day, a bad day usually uh, depends on the kind of people that you've been working with on that day. And and they they are the main influence on on your work. Absolutely. there's There's no... Um, there's not really any place at NATO for the the lone wolf. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Especially when you come in as well, like you need all the support you can get yeah. um, to figure this place out, so to speak. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and is that to you also the biggest difference with working in a private sector? Because you mentioned you have some experience from back in Germany working for a private corporation, um, if you compare both environments, what stands out to you? Yeah, I think I think there's sometimes when I'm talking to colleagues that have only ever worked in the public sector, they sometimes have this misconception that, uh, you know, it's all, it's all roses and sunshine in the private sector. But I think, it, again, it really comes down to the people and to, to the size of the organization. Because um, I've worked in, in several large corporations with several thousand employees so comparable to, to NATO headquarters and um, you're facing similar levels of bureaucracy of internal politics of yeah very much the same challenges really stakeholder management is key <laughs> yes oh yeah and that's another term <laughs> I think you've spent too much time here <laughs> um, you're already touching upon it slightly, but how has working at NATO allowed you to grow as a professional? So it, it again comes back to people. So I've met a couple of amazing, amazing colleagues and I've had one mentor in, in particular who was extremely supportive. He's just a, a few years older than, than myself and has been only a few years longer at NATO than myself. But um, he has like a similar background, similar motivation and um, yeah, I learned I learned a lot from him as a as a leader, but also as a mentor. He was really able to, yeah, point out things to me, what to look out for, um, how to behave, and and all the stakeholder management. Um, he was great at that, so I learned I learned a lot from him. And yeah, he also kind of taught me to to pick who you work for, as 
or pick who you work with rather as much as possible. Because as I've told you, you can't really work alone here. You always have to work with someone. But as you have them in every organization, there are certain people when you address them or you, you ask them for help to, to overcome a certain challenge or a certain, certain obstacle, there are some people who tell you the various reasons why you can't do it the way that you proposed. And then there's silence. No they constructive don't feedback or solutions or no, exactly. thinking along. Yeah. And, and, and you know, it's fair. Sometimes mm -hmm. the, the, the way that you intended to do things, um, they just don't work because of all the structures and procedures that we have in place for most of the time for a good reason. Mm -hmm. But they also are not always very helpful then to, to, to tell you, okay, that those are the reasons why, why it doesn't work the way you wanted it to do. Mm -hmm. But have you thought about this or yeah. have you thought about this? Let me help you. Give some guidance. Exactly. Yeah. Let me help you find a different solution. Yeah. And um, whenever I encounter those kind of people then or those colleagues, then I tend to, if possible, maybe maybe look for someone else to, to ask for support and for help. Um, and I think that that's definitely one of the one of the things that I've learned here. Yeah. Because there are plenty of great and motivated people working for NATO. Definitely. But I think you also have to be honest that in an organization with uh, several thousand people. Um, Again, it comes down to luck that you it run into them. Exactly. It comes yeah. down to luck. And maybe sometimes it's just the chemistry or a different way of working. It doesn't necessarily mean that my way or the highway, but... Uh, yeah. 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 yeah but what you just said actually reminds me of a quote of our next guest. Um, she talks about showing the art of the possible. Yeah. I, and I love that. I was like, oh, we should talk about that during the next episode. <laughs> Let's yeah, that's, elaborate on that's that. That's very interesting. I'm definitely yeah. going to make sure to listen to that. Yeah. Um, Something that, that piqued my interest while you were replying to my previous question, you said that your mentor also told you about behaviors that you could adopt within NATO. Could you elaborate a bit on that? <laughs> it's just a very particular environment. And because he has been there for a while and he, he has a very similar background, I could really um, mirror some of the behaviors that I saw working, the way that he acted with, with colleagues. And of course, also think, things that maybe maybe didn't work or just didn't didn't fit my character because in the end... Um, you can't just copy everything that you that you see from colleagues or from uh, from mentors, but you have to kind of find your own your own version of mm -hmm. of doing things. Um, but but having someone that that also comes to you with a, with a certain level of empathy, um, not coming to you and, and, and telling you, okay, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, you did that wrong, but asking, how are you? Is everything okay? Like. Is there is there any way that I can support you to 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 make your work better? So so this kind of mentorship attitude, um, I'm really trying to to adopt that also for myself. That's great. That's really inspiring. Would that also be your number one advice to the young professionals out there, or to just anyone out there, basically? Uh, Absolutely. If you if you see a person that you want to become, or if you see someone, or maybe even even just a job that you want to work work on, um, use the you know, the, the tools of the 21st century, just very basic stuff like go on LinkedIn, search for people that work for that company, work in their job, look at their CV, reach out to them. If you ask someone about a device and about, um, about helping you out and, and just having a chat about how they got to where they got, I've never met anyone who was like, no, sorry, I don't want to talk to you. They're all excited to talk about their job. They're all excited to talk about their past, about, uh, but yeah, they all want to give you advice and help you. You just have to, you just have to reach out. And that's the same for NATO as well. That's great advice. It's more difficult to get them to stop talking about their job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you said, you could talk for uh, more than an hour about it. So <laughs> yeah. Um, is there anything else you would like to add, Yannick? No, I think um, this this was a very interesting experience and uh, thank you very much for having me. Jan. It was uh, very interesting for me as well and you definitely shared some advice that uh, I'll take with me along the way. Yeah, and like and subscribe to the NATO Jobs podcast. That was exactly. the name, right? Exactly, yeah. Hashtag NATO Jobs. Hashtag NATO Jobs. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for plugging that. <laughs> well, good luck with everything uh, you still have to do today. Good luck with uh, the rest of your career within NATO or any place else. And it really was a pleasure uh, having this talk with you. Thank you. Thank you. And to you, our listener, thank you for listening to today's episode. If you thought the conversation with Yannick was interesting, please stay tuned for our next episode. I'll have a talk with Rebecca Obstler, head of NATO IS Digital Outreach Section. She'll talk about showing the art of the possible, and as she manages a team of 35 people, 
she'll share our hiring manager's advice for candidates. If today's conversation sparked an interest to work for NATO, please have a look at our website, nato.int, so that's nato.int, and click through to our career section. 